Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 9th of August, 2020, and today we're going to have a question and answer session. But before we do that, we have a few things that we're going to cover. So let's jump into the news first of all. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining all around the world. It looks like we've got people from Chicago, a couple people from Chicago. Um, Art's here, Art and Alejandro, Zach. Oh, we've got Pradeep from India. Wow. Um, from the Philippines, we have the Bible Believers video, Mark. Uh, Vincent, good to hear from you. Good to have you here. Victor, it's good to have you here from South Dakota. And Peter's joining us from New Zealand. Um, so let's jump in. A couple of things. First of all, Pluralize. For those that use Pluralize to sync audio to video, there's a kind of an interesting new update. So Red Giant has taken over Pluralize as of, oh, gosh, for a number of years now. But um, what they've done recently, if they've integrated it into DaVinci Resolve. So I've always found... The DaVinci Resolve syncing capabilities were quite good if you had a Blackmagic camera, <laughs> but if you didn't, it, was, uh, it wasn't always a winning proposition. And so it's kind of interesting to see Pluralize integrate into that. So that's kind of a neat thing. And, and not only can you um, drop all of your assets, your video and your audio into Pluralize, have it build a basically sync everything and build a timeline and then export that over to as a timeline into DaVinci Resolve. But you can actually also start in DaVinci Resolve, I believe highlight clips that you want to sync and send them over to Pluralize to do that and then bring it back. So you have a couple of different options there that, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So kind of an interesting update there. There's also been an update to DaVinci Resolve, although in looking at it, it doesn't look like there were any changes on the Fairlight side. So um, the main changes there appear to be for the A10 Mini Pro ISO so that you can record the program plus the four camera inputs plus all of the audio um, into separate isolated files. And then it will bring that over in a, to a timeline into DaVinci Resolve. So uh, nothing really on the, the audio front there. So um, Lau tells me that today is the 10th of August. It, <laughs> yes, Lau, where you live, that is true. Uh, we're, we're still here in the, uh, we're running behind as always here in the United States. So, all right, um, let's go ahead and switch back over here. I want to uh, play a little something here for you. I have uh, kind of a special microphone. And uh, first of all, thanks to Rode. Rode sent this over to me. And uh, and I didn't and I didn't actually request it. It was, a, it was sort of a, on Twitter, they said, what would be your, you know, ideal microphone? And I, I just, I just wrote Rode NTR. And uh, <laughs> for those that aren't familiar with the Rode NTR, the NTR is a ribbon microphone. And if you're not familiar with ribbon microphones, ribbon microphones were some of the earlier um, types of, one of the earlier types of dynamic microphones. So essentially what they were is they have a, a magnet and in between the magnet is suspended a, um, can't hold my hand in front of the microphone. <laughs> um, there's a, suspended between the magnet, there was basically a little piece of foil that was in sort of an accordion shape. And then as you talk, the sound waves would just move that foil a tiny bit and that would generate the electric signal that, um, that would be generated between that and the magnets and then sent out. And the, the trick with, or the interesting thing about the ribbon microphone design is, and I'm speaking in general terms here, it really depends. There's, there are lots of ways to implement ribbon microphones, and some of the more modern ones are very different than that. Um, they still use a ribbon, but they do various things. So a couple of things about ribbon microphones. First of all, they their polar pattern is, at least in the traditional ribbon microphone design, is a figure eight pattern. So it picks up on the front, and it picks up an equal amount on the back of the microphone. And they actually did use these in the early film days um, when they started recording what they called talkies. So they would actually record the sound in addition to picture. And the challenge with them was that the cameras of the time, the film cameras of the time, were extraordinarily noisy. And so um, the way they would have to use the ribbon microphones in that case was my understanding was the microphone would have to be situated near the camera with the knoll, the side of the microphone right by the camera or facing the camera. Um, to cut out as much of the camera noise as possible. Um, so kind of an interesting thing. Um, anyway, I wanted to give you a chance to, to hear a more modern ribbon microphone. Now, another thing about ribbon microphones, at least the older designs, the passive ribbon microphones, is that they needed an extraordinary amount of gain. So 
easily 70 dB of gain. Um, and until recently, you basically had to buy a special preamplifier for them. Nowadays, we have preamplifiers that actually can supply that much gain um, that are pretty uh, more standard. Um, the Mix Pre, for example, on the Zoom F series can do that. Um, so anyway, so those were some of the characteristics. Now, this Rode NTR is a little bit different. It is actually an active ribbon microphone, so it has its own um, amplification circuitry in it. Um, it does require phantom power. That was another thing about the original ribbon microphones. If you applied phantom power to an original ribbon microphone, you could destroy it. So you had to be very careful not to turn on phantom power for the ribbon mics. Um, but with these active mic, uh, app, active ribbon microphones like the Rode NTR, which is just right here, um, you can actually you you actually have to use um, phantom power, and the phantom power um, powers the amplification circuitry. So that's kind of the background on it. Now, where are ribbon microphones used? And that's that's the first thought I wanted to kind of address a little bit. They're, they're used a little bit more in the music world. So when Rode announced and, and released this microphone in 2005, um, there, some of you may have seen it, but on YouTube they had a kind of a promotional video and they had a singer come in. She has a beautiful voice um, and she's sitting at the piano and she's in a beautiful acoustically designed studio room and it just sounds fantastic. It's just an amazing recording. They did a really, really nice job engineering it and mixing it. And... Um, it, it's a, it's just a beautiful sounding mic. And, and the thing is that the traditional ribbon mics tended to have a very dark character to them. They had a very broadcast sound to them. So a lot of rich low end, but not a lot of high end um, sparkle or air, if you will. And so that was kind of the traditional ribbon sound. Now, this NTR actually kind of breaks that mold in some respects where it has a much more articulate uh, high frequency response relative to the traditional earlier ribbon microphones. So what I want to do here is go ahead and, and power that up and let you have a chance to hear it. My my use case, of course, is I will use it for music when I get those opportunities, those rare opportunities to record music. But for me, I'm more interested in it from a voiceover standpoint as well. Now, traditional ribbon microphones are not necessarily the first choice of most voiceover artists because, again, they tend to have a um, that kind of darker sound with not as much high frequency response. But this one, again, is a little bit different. So let's take a listen here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, configure things here over on my console app. We're running through the Apollo X6, again, the universal audio here to, to get your sound here. So let's pull up the console app. Give me just a second. Let me let me give you also some more background before we get to that. <laughs> um, Emma is, is a producer again today. We had some technical issues before we started here. So we're actually back on Ecamm Live because we were having troubles getting the stream to get to, over to YouTube from the A10 Mini. Um, YouTube made some changes on their end. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and change some settings here. So I want to unmute that and mute this. Okay, can you hear me over over here? All right, so this is the Rode NTR, and um, I guess I should have saved some of my explanation for <laughs> how ribbon microphones work until I got over here. But um, the reason I'm over here is that, again, because I mentioned before, this particular microphone, this ribbon microphone, as the traditional ribbon design also had, is a figure eight polar pattern. So I wouldn't want to use it up against the computer screen because then I'd just be getting the reflected sound, and that would not, that probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't sound great. It'd just be kind of phasey and and weird. So here instead we're talking into a bass trap. And what else can I tell you about it? This thing is solidly built. Um, they've done a really nice job. I think it's a as our there we are. Okay. I don't know if we're back or not. We are experiencing some network issues here. So I apologize on behalf of the internets for the, <laughs> the poor quality here. Um, I was talking about the Riven microphone. Hopefully we are back. We're going to, we're going to assume that we are based on what we're seeing here. So, um, a couple things. So this is very, very solidly built, but it is still a very delicate type of, of design because of that, again, that, um, that ribbon 
which is, I think, if I remember correctly, 1.8 microns thick. So it is very, very thin. And it's, it's pressed in a sort of accordion um, pattern, which is interesting as well. And then it's all, that's, there's, that's housed inside of an inner capsule with a little bit of, of kind of a windshield in front of that. And then that's put inside of a shock mount. And then that goes inside of an outer um, grill. But nevertheless, you do have to be careful if you get up too close on these. Um, plosives can actually damage the microphone. So I also am using the, um, this is actually the same shock mount and pop shield that comes with the Rode NT1 if you buy it in the kit form. And so that's providing a little, another layer of protection here. So that's a sample of what the Rode NTR sounds like. For my voice, I think it works pretty nicely. Again, uh, my voice tends to have a, a fair bit of sibilance, and so I think this this actually matches pretty nicely. It's not as harsh, um, but it is definitely um, more articulate than the traditional ribbon microphones. And I've used one before called the Golden Age Project. Oh, what was it? R1 Active Mark III or something like that. I can't remember. R, I don't remember the exact model name, but um, it's kind of a cheaper ribbon microphone. But nevertheless, this one sounds, to my ear, this one sounded very good, so... I think it has some promise, certainly for me, for a voiceover microphone. If I want that kind of, uh, that rich low end to it. That's the thing about the, the ribbon microphones is they have this beautiful, beautiful low end. So, all right, we'll go ahead and switch back. Okay. Um, can you guys uh, just send us something in the chat to make sure that we're still live here? We're... Uh, we are. We're good. Okay. <laughs> we're back. All right. Thanks for that. So um, what I wanted to do here is there's one other microphone uh, that I want to pull in here. This right here is the row, or sorry, the Zoom. Um, I think it's, what's it called? What does the agenda say? The Jen calls it uh, agenda, ZDM1. So this is Zoom's Dynamic Microphone 1 is basically what this is. So I'm, let me go ahead and switch over to this one. Um, we'll come back to the Swiss cheese um, baffle box here in just a little bit. <laughs> let me switch over to this microphone. Give me just a moment here. So if you go back into the console app, let's turn off the phantom power, which is the little red one. On this channel? Yeah. Okay, good. Now let me go ahead and change the cable. Give me one second. Okay. All right. Go ahead and unmute us on channel number two. And we're probably going to need some more gain there. Okay, checking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's probably good there. All right, now we're hearing the Zoom ZD. What's it called? ZD one. The Austin Zoom Dynamic ZD. Microphone. <laughs> um, I'm having a hard time with the name on that one. Um, in any case, this is this one was actually made with the release of their new uh, PodTrack P4, and this comes in a. Um, you can buy a mic pack. It basically is what they call it. And the mic pack includes this microphone, a dyna dynamic microphone it with the windshield here. It includes a set of headphones, um, so over-ear headphones, kind of like this. This is not them, but, um, but in this style. And uh, it also includes an XLR cable to connect it up to the uh, P4. So this is a sense for what that one sounds like. We'll be doing a full review on that one and this one in a little bit, along with the P4. Um, probably not going as in much detail as much detail for the microphone. Well, maybe we will. I don't know. We'll see what people want. But <laughs> another uh, dynamic microphone. So this one's going to be obviously a lot less expensive than a Shure SM7B. And uh, there's your first sample. Just so you can hear what that sounds like. All right, let's go ahead and mute that. All right, we're back on the Earthworks here now. Okay, interesting. Um, All right, uh, let's go back to our agenda here and see where we're at. I think we're going into the question and answer next. Yes, okay. So in the chat, definitely go, go ahead and let us know what you thought of the two different microphones there. I'm curious what you think of the 
um, both the NTR from Rode and also the ZDM1. That's what it's called. <laughs> All right, let's jump to our first question here. Have you had a chance to compare the noise reduction plugin on the MixPre 2 relative to its performance on the high-end sound devices recorders? This is a question from Ken. And Ken, no, I have not. So I have not purchased uh, Noise Assist for the MixPre yet. I do have it on the 888. I did do a, I think you, you probably saw this. I did a video on that demonstrating its capabilities there. Um, however, um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. I have not compared the two of them. But uh, Alan Cavedo, and I don't know if he's here, Rollin Man, um, has been has used the noise assist on the Mix Pre, and he's getting what he thought were very good results. So um, I think the only difference, really, I the the sense I get is they're using the same algorithm, but they can only support one instance on the Mix Pre, whereas they can support two instances on the eight series recorders. So. Um, he seemed to indicate that he was getting very good results, and he was applying, I think, 6 dB of uh, attenuation to the noise. So um, pretty good pretty good results there, so definitely something uh, worth checking into. And then I think, um, so, so if I had to guess, it's the same algorithm. And I would say, the thing is, is that it's, huh, it's one of those things that... You, you probably would not use for narrative filmmaking, I wouldn't think, um, but I think it could have its uses in other situations, especially live situations. So if you're live streaming from some noisy location, that's where it would probably make a little bit more sense from my point of view. Although some people say, well, yeah, I'll apply it to the to one of the mixed channels and uh, just give the give post that option. So it just really depends. I don't, I think it's really the job of the production sound mixer and the production sound mixer's crew to optimized noise performance on set. Um, and I probably wouldn't rely on that for, again, for narrative filmmaking, but it's a, it's a great tool to have in the kit. And there are cases where it may make some sense. So those are some thoughts there. Okay. Um, from Victor, uh, when will your ATEM course be out? Well, I'm taking next week, uh, starting tomorrow off from my day job to work on it. If everything goes as hoped, <laughs> we'll hopefully release it by uh, this time next week. So that's the plan. We'll see how it goes. All right, next up from Bill, we have a question. I'm currently focused on indie narrative work, mostly in short films. I'm using a Sennheiser MKH-50 and a Zoom H6. I'm debating upgrading the recorder to a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6.2 or 10.2. The main motivation is that when I'm working with quiet sources, such as whispered scenes or some Foley sounds where I have to push up the gain, I may have to denoise it later. I'm curious if you think there will be a significant difference in noise performance of the cashmere preamps to warrant the upgrade. Thoughts? Well, you guys tell us in the chat here, help out our friend Bill, get, let's get your impressions, but this is what I can say about it. I think um, it depends on the noise you're getting. If you're getting self noise from the preamplifiers in the H6, then yes, unquestionably the Mix Pre 2 Series in particular will deliver a cleaner performance, no question. Um, however, uh, and Bill, you may already know this, so I, I, I don't mean to, this to come across the wrong way, but if just in case, um, some people mix up this concept of self noise from a signal chain and ambient noise. And so they get a bunch of ambient noise in their recording because you know there's a lot of noise in the location where they're recording. And they say, oh, it's so noisy, I don't like this. I don't like this recording, it's too noisy. And they start looking at new gear. Well. It's important to make that distinction. Um, so obviously the mix pre is not going to help you if there is noise, ambient noise in the, the location where you're recording. But if it is self noise that you're experiencing, that kind of low level hiss, then yes, it'll definitely make a difference. So let's go ahead and see what the rest of our friends here in the chat have to say as well. So thanks for the question, Bill. All right, Vincent agrees that, yeah, the cashmere preamps definitely have a better signal to noise ratio than the H6 and a better equivalent input noise rating as well. No question, and I agree. Um, so yeah, it'll help from that standpoint, but just keep in mind that it doesn't solve um, ambient noise. Okay, let's move on to the next one there. Next up from Hal. I'm shooting my first scripted web videos, renting a location, even have a DP and a PA who will, and I will run audio. I have a Sennheiser G4, which came with a mic that is very round and large. <laughs> it's great, but nearly impossible to hide. I don't, want to, I don't want the mic to show on camera. I've usually borrowed a flatter, rounder mic from a friend and taped it to the sternum when I wanted to hide, when I wanted to hide it. 
If the actor is wearing a button-down shirt, do you suggest this is the way to go? I know a very basic question. Let's pause there. Um, I think that's a fine, that's a fine um, approach. Yes, uh, I, uh, with button-down shirts, a lot of times what I will do these days is, and it it varies in every single situation. Sometimes that'll you know taping it to the sternum will be great. Other times the clothing will rub against it and it will not be great. So you're just going to have to kind of work on that situation. But that, yes, that is a valid approach. And and sometimes the way I go for certainly for um, narrative filmmaking. Now, if I'm doing corporate stuff, I'll be less likely to do that. And in corporate, what I'll typically do is I, I don't know which microphone you're going to be using. It sounds like it's hopefully smaller than the ME2, which is what comes with the G4. But um, if you do get one of those, you know, if you get something like a Sankin Cost 11 or whatever it is you're using, um, those work, you, you can typically run those into a buttonhole on a button-down shirt where they'll be fairly well hidden and yet you'll get very good audio response that way. And the nice thing about that setting is, at least in some cases, is that it moves with the clothing. So if the person does move around, um, instead of rubbing against the clothing, it'll move with the clothing. So you'll still get some potential clothing rustle, but you won't get the clothing rustle <laughs> that comes with fabric actually rubbing against the microphone capsule. So, um, but what I would say, Hal, and I think you'll probably, if you haven't already found this, you certainly will, is that sometimes when you get to the location and you're actually wiring people up, um, you're going to have to experiment and you'll have to have them move around a little bit and see how well the position you chose is working. And if it's not working, you're going to have to kind of tweak it and find a new place to do it, you know, a new place to put it or move it around a little bit or use a different material to tape it or, you know, all sorts of different things like that. So we have some older videos, <clears throat> excuse me, where we talk about a lot of different strategies. If you look up Curtis Judd Ursa straps, um, you'll find a video where Simon Bish from Ursa came on and gave a lot of really good tips on, on how to hide lavalier microphones. So the reality of lavalier microphones, just so everyone, you know, for the, for those that haven't worked with them enough yet, um, you will constantly be fighting clothing rustle, most likely. So um, you got to kind of tune your skills on getting those things hidden, and it really comes down to experimentation. So, all right, moving on. I'll also set up a Boom, the Deity D3 Pro, and plug that into a Deity Connect receiver and push the audio wirelessly to my audio recorder. I'm concerned that unless I shoot very tight on both A and B cam, the boom audio won't be too great. I'll bring tons of C-stands and can hang towels. Is that the most I can do? Um, holding recording scratch into the camera. So how, a couple of things. If you can get anything more substantial than towels, I would. Um, towels are not gonna do, I mean, they're better than nothing, but they're not gonna be as substantial as a proper sound blanket or at least the heaviest moving blankets you can find. So those will help more. So I would, first of all, focus on getting heavier blankets. The trick with the uh, D3 Pro is it's a very short shotgun microphone and it does not have the most um, focused puller pattern. So yeah, if you're gonna have to pull back and be operating at one meter or two meters away from the talent with wider shots, you're gonna get a lot of room. So you're definitely gonna wanna do as much as you can to manage the room. And you may have to rely more on the lavaliers in that case. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess what I would say is yeah, the C-stands and uh, blankets would be good. Uh, and I guess that's the most you can do. You can, If you have budget to, or to borrow or, you know, anything for a longer shotgun microphone, then you could potentially get a more focused polar pattern and be able to operate at a little more distance and still not pick up quite as much of the room. So those are some recommendations that hopefully are helpful there for you. All right. Thanks to Alan for the super chat. Appreciate that. All right. The next one is not so much a question, but uh, Ed... Did a little bit of interesting research here. For those that use the Mix Pre and the AA battery sled, you know how difficult it is to get AA batteries in and out, <laughs> and uh, especially the Eneloop batteries. The Eneloop Pros here is what Ed was using. He actually got out some calipers and measured the diameter of the batteries and found that they're not actually perfectly round. And in fact, you can see here that if you orient the batteries like he shows here, where it shows the plus and minus symbols facing up, that's going to be the best fit, which is re was really fascinating to me. So um, if you do it with the Eneloop Pro facing up, it's going to put a lot more stress on the battery sled and it won't fit as well. And it could pop off the back of your uh, Mix Pre as well. So great information from Ed. So Ed, thanks so much for sharing that. And that's uh, really useful. Again, if you need a, a quick way to remember that, have the plus and minus symbols at the either end of the battery facing up towards you out of the uh, 
battery sled there. Okay, moving on. All right, uh, Rob has a note here. How's he questions regarding location sound? Also recommended he do whatever he can to control ambient sound, turn off air conditioning, etc. Absolutely agree. So thanks for that, Rob. Yeah, anything, it is the production sound mixer's job to keep an ear out for all of that stuff and do what they can within reason to eliminate all ambient sound and noise. Okay, good. A question here from Alejandro. I have a film shoot coming up in September and production is using a rain machine. Currently, I'm using the Rycoach Super Shield and it's worked fine. I know I need a rain cover at some point and although I do have a boom op for this shoot, I think I should go solo for these those scenes. On that note, my gut instinct is telling me I should invest in the Deity Lav Pros soon. However, do you think my current laws will hold up with water? I'm currently using the MKE2 Golds and a Countryman B3. Also, if you have any suggestions for rain covers and their prices, that would be awesome. Thanks for taking my question. Okay, well, let's talk about the rain covers first of all. So we have uh, over here at Gotham Sound, there is the Rycoat Rain Duck Rain Cover. Uh, something worth looking into. It's a price, it's, you know, there's a price involved. <laughs> uh, but I think the idea is that they've they've designed it so that it protects the, um, the blimp cover from getting saturated. And at the same time, it also, I think the material is made so that when a raindrop hits it, it doesn't make as much noise. So that's one worth considering there as far as uh, the boom mic is concerned. All right, moving back over to the question. Uh, I thought, I, I don't know if the MKE2 Golds are water resistant at all. I don't remember. It's been so long since I used them. But um, I, I wanted to say, I know that they released, uh, they actually essentially took the MKE2 and made a version for GoPro. And I remember talking to one of the product managers at Sennheiser about that. They were very excited. I was actually at, at, at NAB when they announced it. And um, I asked him, well, how does that hold up when you're like out in the snow? Because they had all this footage, uh, you know, beautiful footage of people skiing and stuff. And he said, oh, it's great. It's um, it's basically waterproof. So I don't know if that's the same design that went into the MKE2s. Um, but in any case, I would look into that a little bit more. So I would give the the folks over at Gotham Sound a call and see what they can recommend. Um, and I'm not sure. I think Countryman has a waterproof mic, but I don't think it's the B3. Um, I don't remember for sure on that one, Alejandro. So um, I guess it depends. Do you know how wet the the people are going to get? Is this a they're going to have a rain machine? So I assume it's a narrative piece. Um, do you know, are they going to be just completely exposed out there? If so, I think that's going to make a, a difference there. And I think you're going to want to look at some things. Um, I would also look at Alan Williams over on the Sound Speeds YouTube channel. Recently did a piece where he showed how to uh, essentially waterproof a transmitter. So you may want to watch that if you haven't seen that already. I think I think you follow his channel. So um, if you haven't, definitely worth checking that out as well, because you're going to need to protect that as well. But I'm not positive on the, the MKE2 and the Countryman B3. Um, blue button again. Oh, wait, no. Here we are. All right. <laughs> Froze again. Yes, um, we are having some network issues here today. So it appears to be something on our side. I don't know what it is. Um, I was actually on a Zoom call with my family before this, uh, 30 minutes before we started here, and it was fine. So I don't know what's going on. So we're, we're getting the disconnect messages on this side. So I apologize for that again. I apologize on behalf of All West Communications, who is providing our fiber connection to the internet, which is um, not acting very much like fiber. <laughs> um, so anyway, okay. Uh, Andy says, Hi, Curtis. Self-recording videos. I had a half second dropped audio, but noticed that, but noticed, uh, not noticed until the edit. Any way to monitor for this when self-recording? Um, yes, I do have a recommendation, actually. <clears throat> um, you might consider a set of in-ear monitors. So they're not like wearing big headphones and um, they fit into your ears. I don't usually wear them because I, I don't find them as comfortable, but it is an option in terms of uh, getting sound. Um, so these fit pretty discreetly in your ears and then the cables go over the top and around the back of your ears and then the cable can run down your back. So it's a little bit more discreet than wearing big overhead, uh, big over ear, excuse me, monitors like this. Um, these are these here are the Shure, uh, I don't know the model number. Let me see if I can see it on here. 
don't know if they put the, um the young eyes. what it's the 215s okay it says on here 215 i thought it was too small no it's uh the se 215 um, these are less than a hundred dollars and they're actually pretty good i was pretty impressed with the sound of them so that's something to consider andy yeah it's tough if you're self-recording and um and you get a drop out then that's that's a rough one especially if you wrap everything and go home <laughs> um, what ear pads are you wearing this is from vincent on your dt 770s so the old gray ones that i've had on the dt 770s are, are the originals and i was trying to remember how long I'd had those. I'd had them at least eight years. And um, they just started, uh, they started coming apart at the seam right here next to the ear cup. So these are just actually replacements and you can get them in gray or in black. So I got them in black this time. A little less, a uh, little more discreet, not quite as, they're not yelling, I, <laughs> I'm DT 770s as loudly, so. All right. How's the Sennheiser versus Shure IEM comparison test going? They're on hold at the moment, uh, budget, budget constraints. Um, it's still at the one of the top things on my list to get those sorted out, but um, the budget is basically frozen for the moment. So <laughs> um, thanks. Okay. Um, but yes, Kevin or Ken, it's still definitely very much on my in my radar here. All right. Mark asks, I have a question about the Mix Pre 3.2 and 32-bit float recording. When using 32-bit float, can or should gain setup be configured differently compared to a 24-bit with limiters? And once the recording is made, what is a good recommendation for audio normalization? I'm currently currently using a Sennheiser MKE 600 when booming and the Sennheiser AVX ME2 wireless lav, depending on the job. Also using DaVinci Resolve 16.2 latest version. Okay, uh, Mark, couple things. Number one, um, fortunately for you, the AVX does have its dynamic range feature, which will basically act, it acts kind of like a limiter from what I can tell. Um, so that's going to save you because the reality is, is that most wireless systems, when you push them, um, you have multiple gain stages there in essence. So <clears throat> in many cases, so if you're using a mix pre, presumably what's happening is you have a preamplifier at the transmitter, and then you're sending line level signal out, uh, into the mix pre. But the problem is, is that if things clip at the transmitter, they've clipped. And so there's nothing the Mix Pre 3 can do about that, even when you're in 32-bit float mode. So fortunately though, the AVX has that kind of dynamic range feature. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. It's hard to clip it. Um, so you're probably in pretty good shape there. But with the boom microphone, the MKE 600, um, what I found is that if you push the gain a little hotter when you're in 32-bit float mode, it changes the character of the preamplifier. It actually sounded richer had more low end. It almost like it, it was almost like the um, the analog stage of the preamplifier was saturating a little bit. So it can be a really interesting sound. You can you can you know kind of play around with it and see what you think. But I would typically um, probably I would probably go for about the same um, you know the same strategy as when recording twenty four bit typically. So unless you you know really gotten used to what happens when you push them. Um, so that, that would be my advice, just kind of go with the same approach. And that way, if anything does hit up against zero, then you're not losing it on the boom mic. So that would be my general approach, but definitely experiment with it and see what happens when you do push the gain a little hotter, um, because I think it can do some interesting things there. And I think if you push hard enough, I think you may run into situations where it starts to saturate heavily and it may not be a great sound. So um, definitely give, some, give it some try and see, give it a try and see what happens here. All right, Cuisine Ed. Um, did you notice Adobe Premiere Pro added sound, timecode, LTC into the multi-camera menu? I did, but nobody has been able to figure out how to make it work <laughs> that I've talked to. So if you've actually figured out how to make that work, um, that would be really awesome to hear what your experience has been with it. All right. Norm says, any thoughts on what spectrum of wireless to invest in given the recent unpack and future auctions? Is it worth investing in a company license for the upper bands? 
Well, Norm, that's a question. That's a business question at some level. So if you if you want to get a license, um, the business is going to need to afford that, be able to afford that, and also um, be able to go in for the you know whatever else is involved in the licensing process. I'm not even sure what's involved in that. Um, right now, I'm invested in the. Um, I'm invested mostly in the the upper 400s and into the 500s, so I'm clear of the 600 range, which was auctioned off here and is no longer legal to use here in the United States. Um, hopefully, that lasts for a good long time. I don't know what the plans are for the FCC as far as auctioning additional um, additional frequencies here in the in the next next little bit. So, in any case, okay. All right, let's go on to the next question. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. Let's go out to the comments or to the chat and see if we have anything else going on here. Uh, looks like Alejandro says, it's going to be a very active scene in the rain with a bit of dialogue. Does Rykote make anything similar to what you showed me for Lavaliers? Um, that I don't know. Um, that is a, I have to confess, Alejandro, this is a domain that I haven't operated in, so I've never had to you know, be super careful. Did I just hear a click in the audio? Oh, uh, you're not, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, in any case, uh, that would be another one to call Gotham or True Audio and just see what they recommend there. I, uh, I think what you might find is you might want to rent a lavalier that is actually moisture proof in some fashion. So um, just to protect your investment. Again, they, can, they should be able to tell you on the MKEs as well. So... Um, Victor mentions that ribbon mics are often used with sax and woodwinds. Yes, give a nice, nice response to some of those. Uh, miking a guitar amp, very good. Does your brother have any ribbons in his studio? Cole's forty thirty eight are really popular on drums. Uh, no, he does not. He actually doesn't do as much music anymore. <laughs> um, and in fact, on drums, he he actually sends. Uh, when he is producing someone, he sends the drums to a different engineer in town that's actually better set up for doing drums. So he doesn't, he, he actually, I guess, picks and chooses his battles, so to speak, <laughs> these days. And so he doesn't, uh, he doesn't mess with that as much. So he lets somebody else do the engineering on the drums, and then he'll do everything else from there. All right. Can you explain the Swiss cheese baffle box? So uh, so all of the bass traps that you see in the room here, it typically, like this one here, this one back here, um, we've got a couple on the ceiling. Those are from GI GIK Acoustics. They are broadband traps. And the difference is that the Swiss cheese one that you see behind me here is a portable model of the same thing. It's not quite as thick. This one I think is just about two inches thick. It's caught, they, they kind of pitch it as a portable vocal booth. Um, I actually have two of them and they just basically are like a, a book shape. So you can fold them up to move them around and then unfold them to, um, to actually use them. And so the reason I put that there is that with the ribbon microphone, because it is sensitive on the back, um, I didn't want the sound bouncing all over. So I didn't want to put it down right here in front of a computer screen and be picking up the reflected sound off of the computer monitor at the same time I'm picking up my voice on the front. So it would have been a just a bad way to demonstrate <laughs> the capabilities of that microphone. So that's the story behind that there. Uh, Vincent says, for the NTR, if Curtis reads this later, how the lows go with a high-pass filter on? So there's no high-pass filter on the microphone itself. Um, but if we wanted to, we could switch back over to that and turn a high-pass filter on and see how it sounds. Let's try that. Okay, don't turn it on yet. I've got to unplug this other microphone. We've only got two inputs on this interface. One second here. <clears throat> um, actually, go over to the console, pull the gain down to 45. Okay, now for mic number two, keep it muted. Turn on phantom power. Give it just a moment. This one takes a little bit. It actually, when you apply phantom power, it takes it a little bit to settle in. 
and we have the high pass filter on. I don't know. I think this is an 80 hertz high pass filter. So I'm going to I'm going to go over here and talk into it and I'm going to ask Emma to turn it on and off. So we're going to turn the high pass which is a little yellow one there. Let's have it on at first. Okay, so go ahead and mute this mic and open the other mic. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. So here we are on the NTR again and we have the high pass on currently. Okay, high pass is currently on. Again, I'm probably in inches, about 12 inches from the microphone. And let's go ahead and turn the high pass filter off. High pass filter is now off. Do you hear a difference over there? No, you don't? Okay. <laughs> you may on the live stream. It's a little harder when you're in the room. Certainly I cannot hear super well. It's always harder for me to kind of judge that kind of thing when it's me talking. Um, but in any case, this is with the high pass filter off. Let's go ahead and turn it back on and the high pass filter is turned back on at this point. So that may not be the best example from the standpoint that it is, well, 80 Hertz is not, I don't know what the curve is on it. I don't know if it's a minus 12 dB per octave or less, I don't know. I think it's a fairly gentle one though. So there may not be a huge difference there. So, okay, let's go ahead and mute this one. We're back. All right. Thanks, Vincent, for the question. Hopefully that uh, was revealing or interesting in some fashion here. <laughs> All right. What other th items do we have here in the chat tonight? Can we do an IP rating on mics? Um, some microphones do have IP ratings. Um, and then the stream went down. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I said, uh, uh, Emma will fix it. And indeed she did. She did a brilliant job. <coughs> All right. Soundspeeds is having buffer issues the other night as well. YouTube must have COVID. <laughs> I don't know if it does or not. They actually, I will say this, uh, YouTube just changed their um, live studio. And one of the things that's confusing is that every live stream that I've done in the last two years now uh, has a key represented in this drop-down box. And it's like, what? This was never there before. So generally what you did is every time you created a new live stream, it would just automatically create a new key. And there was no way to access the older keys as far as I'm aware. Uh, but now evidently you can go and access all of your old keys. So what we found was we could not live stream from the a10 mini pro it just wouldn't um none of those would work so all right greg has an interesting question accidentally recorded 44.1 kilohertz is this an issue for video sync should i resample before import into the nonlinear editor that's a great question greg i i've actually run into that a couple times myself um i have not found it generally to be an issue for sync but if you if you are going to release in a format or you know wherever you're going with your video, if it's if it's going to need to to be in 48 kilohertz, then yeah, you're going to have to resample at some point. And I would trust you to do a quality job of resampling versus a video editor. So um, yeah, I probably would convert it and just see. But I haven't generally found that to be a big. If you have a solid clock, um, I haven't found you know being on the you know being on 44.1 kilohertz versus 48 when you should have been on 48. Um, I haven't found that to create issues with sync generally. So as long as the recording product, you know, the recorder has a pretty solid clock. So good question. I don't know if anyone else has different experience on that, please let us know. All right, Bob, uh, what settings would you recommend for the Mix Pre 3.2 to record live piano flute in a living room using two Shure KSM 137SL mics recording video with a Nikon Z6? I would go to 48 kilohertz, 24 bit, and I would do a sound check and get the gain on each of the microphones. Well, you're doing a stereo recording, so I would uh, link the two of them into a stereo pair on the mix pre, and then I would gain up until the peaks were hitting somewhere around minus 18 generally. That's the way I would probably approach it. Anyone else has other input? Love to hear it from you. Okay, Vincent. 
Thank you for the super chat. And he says, it does sound a bit tighter to me, at least with the high pass filter on. Interesting. Okay, good. Good. I haven't, I've, I haven't done a whole lot of experimenting with that mic, but um, it kind of, it, it excites me. That is a mic that actually got me excited. Um, the last mic that got me excited was this, <laughs> the Earthworks. Um, and I've seen a lot of mics, so many of them don't excite me anymore, <laughs> but, but uh, that one did, so... Okay, John says, John Photo, thank you for doing this. Might you have a recommended recommended USB audio interface for someone wanting these features? One, live compression. Two, comparatively low cost. Three, phantom power. And four, auto mix. Oh, that is a tough one. Um, uh, I don't know how low cost, comparatively low cost is. Uh, in this particular case, that's a that's a pretty tough one. I guess um, the closest thing I can think of is probably the Rodecaster Pro, but it doesn't really have auto mix. It has a noise gate instead that you can apply to each individual channel. I don't really like to approach it that way. Um, that can be really difficult to set up and get it working reliably, um, but that is an option there. That's probably the least ex expensive option I can think. Well, no, I take that back. Uh, well, there's a Zoom F4, but it doesn't have compression. It's comparatively low cost, phantom power, and auto mix, but it doesn't have the live compression. Um, there probably are some mixers out there that that do uh, everything except for the auto mix. <laughs> and then there's the Mix Pre that does everything except for the live compression. It, it does have the, of course, the limiter, but no live compression. So... Yeah, I, I, there's probably some like traditional mixing boards if you're open to that form factor. There are probably some of those out there that you could find. Um, I don't know if Midas, maybe Midas has something like that. I think the Zoom L, Live Track L12 has live compression, but I don't think it has auto mix. Yeah, that's just, just a tough combination there. Um, what you could potentially do, well, no. All right, we are apparently back. Uh, frozen, connection broke. Hold that pose, Curtis. Buffer road, maybe provisional on that recommendation. <laughs> Had it all till he said, Motu Ultralight MK4 with all you want, but no auto mix. Yeah, so that's the tough is, uh, that's the tough thing is it's hard to get that for those four items into the same device uh, with... You can get all those items in one device, but not the comparatively low cost, depending on what your definition of that is. So, um, Zach says, the Cinco D2 excites me. I'm glad that's working out for you, Zach. Um, so I'm glad that that microphone found a new home, a new happy home. So put it to good use. I'm really excited for you on that. All right, Cuisine Ed, um, what is so industry standard about the MKH 416? Uh, <laughs> um I don't use it that much. I own it, but I don't use it that much. I bought it actually to be used primarily as a reference to other, when I'm testing other microphones, just because so many people ask to, you know, hear a new microphone versus the Sennheiser MKH416 when we're talking about shotgun microphones. Um, some people just like the sound. It's, it does have a rich low end. It has that super crisp top end that was uh, originally voiced for analog recording, tape recording. Um, but some people just love that crisp noise. Cri <laughs> I shouldn't call it noise. <laughs> they love that crisp sound. Uh, for me, it gets a little harsh on a lot of voices, including my own. So it's not the first mic I pull out. But if I do, if I'm going to be working with someone that has a very dark voice without a lot of articulation and they have this tendency, you know, on some mics to start sounding like they're just going, you know, just a whoa, 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 whoa kind of sound to them. That's when an MKH 416 or um, also the Shep CMC um, 641 is a pretty nice fit. Um, whereas there, those, I don't like those mics on my own voice, but I don't know what's so industry. I think it's just one of those things where, um, certainly in the gaming streamer world, um, you know, it was all word of mouth. And it's the same thing with the Shure SM7B. The Shure SM7B is a good microphone, don't get me wrong, um, but it's not the best microphone out there. And it requires a ton of gain. And so people are, you know, working with a Zoom H6 and then they go buy a Sure, SM7B, and then they have to crank the gain to max to get a good signal for a live stream, and then they're frustrated. So, <laughs> anyway, 
Um, so I, I, I don't really know beyond that. It is, it's a fine sound and I don't think you, I don't think anyone, most people that own that microphone aren't disappointed with it. You know, they can get good results and you can always EQ and post. So I don't, I, that's what I have to say about it. <laughs> Would you ever recommend 32 bit floating point over 24 bit for recording live music on the mix pre three, two? Yeah, sure. Um, if you, if you have a post process that will support 32 bit float, I don't see any problem with that. You know, I don't know if you are, you know, typically with music, if you, if you're multi-tracking, that is to say you're recording one, you know, instrument at a time and kind of overdubbing them, you don't usually need to push the gain that hard. Um, and so there's really not necessarily a need for 32 bit float. So it can't, it can't hurt if you, if you have a post workflow or a mixing workflow that can adapt to that but it isn't really, I don't really see a massive advantage. Now, if you're recording live music, that can be different. Um, if, um, if you're not at the mixing board controlling everything from there, um, 32 bit float could potentially, could potentially save you. Um, again, I don't, I don't see that as kind of the main use case for 32 bit float, but I don't think it could hurt either. So, all right. Uh, let's see. What's Ken's comment there? Universal Audio can host plugins within the interface, but I don't know if it can host a Dugan. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, I'm, I haven't seen a Dugan from Universal Audio, so an auto mix. So not a, a there are some other, um, gosh, who was it? My friend was talking about this. Alan Tepper, who has a podcasting, a podcast about podcasting. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Beyond Podcasting, in fact. Um, when the Zoom F8... N first came out and it had its auto mix feature. He asked me to come on his show and we talked about auto mixing and there were some other devices he identified that did auto mixing as well. And they were in the, they were more traditional mixers as if actually one of them was a digital mixer, I believe. So kind of a rack mount, I think it might've even been a rack mount mixer and then you control it with your iPad. Um, but I think it was in about the $1,000 range. So I don't know if that fits within your definition of reasonably priced, but there's an interesting one there. All right, Bill, thanks so much for the super chat. Late to the chat tonight, but thanks for doing these. My pleasure, and thank you for sticking with us while the internet gods have uh, unleashed their wrath upon us <laughs> tonight. Um, all right. Lost me again. Connection broke, frozen again. Hold that pose. Okay, we can go back down. I think we got everything up above that. All right, what is AutoMix, Rob asks. Um, essentially, Rob, what AutoMix does is that if you are, for example, recording a podcast, and presumably, unless you have really obnoxious people on your podcast, or even if you do, um, what it does essentially is that when one person's talking, their mic is open, and the other people that are not talking, their mics are brought down in level. And the benefit of that is that that means that the people who are not talking, their microphones are not capturing reflected sound, um, or at least not as much. And so you get an overall cleaner mix. So it means a lot less work in post-production to get a really great sound. Now, this is especially important or especially useful, I should say, in cases where you have more than two people. It can help with two people, but it's even more helpful once you have three and more people. And when you have that many open microphones in a relatively small space, things get pretty messy pretty quickly. So that's what auto mix really helps with. It helps kind of create a, a, a cleaner overall mix for you. And it does it automatically. So normally, if you had someone live mixing, a production sound mixer live mixing, when the when a person's talking, they would use the fader and push it up on the person talking and they pull the faders back for the people who are not talking. And then likewise, when one of the other people started talking, they'd push their fader up and bring the fader back down for the person who was talking but is no longer talking. So... That's what it does. It does it on an automated basis. The Mix Pre um, series recorders can use auto mix and the Zoom F series as well. The four, six, eight, and eight N can all do auto mix. Um, so now there are different ways. They each go about it a slightly different way. Don't want to get too much into the weeds, I guess, because that wasn't necessarily what you asked, but I'm just excited about auto mix. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> um, the Sound Devices version called Mix Assist works a little bit differently. 
it uses this whole series of rules to determine how much to, you know, how much to attenuate. And um, then there's Dugan auto mixing, which is a kind of an interesting approach where it, it essentially works really hard. It, it, it's optimized to ensure that the overall loudness doesn't change overall in deciding how much to attenuate the other microphones that aren't currently active. So it's a pretty interesting approach and it works very nicely. It sounds very transparent. So those are some thoughts. All right, we have some talk about Nagras. Who's talking about Nagras out there? Vincent's favorite is the Nagra T. Now, Vincent, do you have a Nagra T? NTSB recorder of choice. <laughs> um, I've never, I never used a Nagra. I did actually shoot film on a camera, still photos, I should say, um, but never, um, <laughs> but I never uh, actually sh uh, recorded audio to tape. And as I was talking about auto mixing, uh, Rob, Rob was just enabling me there. So thank you, Rob, <laughs> for. Um, oh, Vincent does not have a Nagra. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, all right. In any case, people, thank you so much for your patience during this crazy live stream and our internet issues here. We appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, thanks to Emma for sticking with us during the chaos. I look forward to going back to the ATEM stream. Yeah, we're hoping to go back to the ATEM next week. It's a lot smoother that way. So in any case, thanks everyone for checking in and I hope you get out there and make some great sound this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.